difference. Um, I'm really looking forward to the next session, which I'm excited to introduce. In 2021, former Facebook data scientist Francis Haugen disclosed thousands of internal documents to lawmakers and regulators, which sparked allegations of Facebook int intentionally placing profit over the public good. Please join me in welcoming Francis in conversation with Color of Change President Rashad Robinson, who is leading great work at Color of Change, which is the largest uh, online organization of African Americans in the country, um, and Doris Duke Foundation President Sam Gill, who will moderate today's discussion. I'll turn it over to you, Sam. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, David. Thanks, Vince, and the Media Impact Funders team for uh, hosting this conversation. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Rashad and Francis, thank you both most of all. I think this will be less stressful than congressional testimony, or at least yeah. I hope it will. That'll be my, my goal. Um, but let's, uh, let's get into it, because these are among the most urgent issues that we are discussing as a society, but they're also, in some ways, the most abstruse. And I think they're questions about which people have a lot more anxiety than insight. And I'd actually, I'd like to start with you, Rashad, in essence, to give us sort of a history of the present, of what sort of leads us to the current moment that we're in, in which you are playing a critical role, Francis, which is, you know, Rashad, there's a, the anxieties had been bubbling up. You know, the tech lash, as it's been called, starts four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. More recently, under your leadership and that of a few others, this turns into a civil rights question. So tell us a little bit about how that happened yeah. and why that happened and where it, it's left us today. No, great. Well, it's great to be with you. Um, great to see all of you, kind of. Um, uh, and uh, always great to be with you, Francis. And this is much better than having to yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, answer questions from uh, the right wing. Um, so. For us, um, you know, we, like a lot of groups, were trying to build presence on the platform, trying to reach our members, trying to engage um, and, you know, highlight the issues and give people ways to take action. And we started to see some of the rules on these platforms not fully sort of make sense and align. And as an accountability organization, we engaged. One of those questions was the, the doxing and revealing of information of Black Lives Matter activists. Another was the sharing of information with law enforcement without rules or warrants. Another was there was a woman um, probably about seven or eight years ago by the name of Kareen Gaines in Baltimore who was having a mental health episode and um, was um, then having an interaction with the police and was filming it on Facebook Live, the um, police called Facebook, got them to turn off the Facebook Live, and Kareem Gaines ends up dead, and we have no video of it. Um, and um, Baltimore ended up having to, um, you know, pay her um, family, um, and um, you know, and but in in that all of those things led us to engage Facebook. We went back and forth with Facebook um, for years. We ended up getting Facebook to agree to a civil rights audit. Um, and, um, and then only to have them sort of not stall on the civil rights, to stall on the civil rights. So we worked with Cory Booker's office to have him um, ask Mark Zuckerberg a question at you know, one of the Senate hearings that Mark Zuckerberg about the civil rights audit. They committed to the audit. Then we find out in the New York Times while we're going back and forth with Facebook that they had hired a PR firm to attack our organization um, and to sort of place and plant stories about us. And we, that ends up with us in more direct dialogue with both Sheryl Sandberg and Mark Zuckerberg about um, the issues at Facebook. We get them to commit to releasing the civil rights audit. We, it shows that they hadn't done anything. Then we work and we move. I bring Sheryl Sandberg to Atlanta to meet with frontline activists. We're doing all of this work to try to help this huge company self-regulate with a deep understanding that self-regulated companies are unregulated companies. But we continue to try to do this because we don't have the political levers to actually do anything else. And there's a whole set of laws and rules that allow this company to sort of evade accountability for us to not have sort of the type of civil um, uh, litigation paths, to, to not have other accountability paths. And so um, we, end up, we end up getting them to agree to things in their office, all sorts of policies around voter, voter rights suppression and census suppression, being in the room with um, folks like um, Vanita Gupta and Sherlyn Eiffel, and, and of course the leaders of Facebook, you know, we were bringing our members to the fold. And then we watch as we win those wins, 
to only see that the minute Donald Trump violates those rules that we run, that they decide not to enforce those rules, that they make decisions, and once again, we end up right back where we are. And so, you know, I, I come to this, can, to all of this, with sort of a deep understanding both of the role of racial justice as getting us to the table in the first place, the reason why they felt like they had to engage and deal with us in ways that they did not have to deal with other groups that might sort of occupy a, a, a traditional sort of good government or left or whatever you may think of. They had to deal with us and contend with us and go back and forth with us because of the sort of power of racial justice and the role of racial justice. But I think at the end of the day, um, you know, we should not be in a place um, where we have these huge companies and we need whistleblowers to tell us what's happening inside of them. Yeah. That the only time we actually learn what's happening or what's truthful is when someone is brave and risk everything to expose what's happening inside of a company. And that is a result of failures of our government. And the ways that we actually solve that is actually building the type of infrastructure from advocacy to people power to research to legal to force our government to actually put in place the mechanisms to hold a company accountable. And the, I'll finally say this be, to end, we have done this before in this mm -hmm. country. And right now we have a whole set of things that we have won and fought for from a civil rights perspective. Everything from fair housing and credit to all of these issues that these companies believe that they can evade and get around um, because they have sort of a new technology. And if we don't get our hands around it, every single time something new is created, we will end up having to go back to square one on the things that so many of us fought for. So we are in a moment where we still do need whistleblowers, so let's hear from one. Uh, Francis, I'd actually, I'd love to start with sort of the prologue, which is you're at Facebook as all of this is happening. Mm -hmm. what, what prompts you to stand up and say something? Is it an epiphany? Mm -hmm. Is it a long, is it a persistent feeling or worry? Is it something that you had wanted to do from the beginning? What is, what's going on in your head that leads you to take this stand? So, so whistleblowing is never like plan B or plan C. It's like plan H, J, I, K, somewhere down the, the, the lower of the road. Um, I, I knew that there were challenges with Facebook before I joined Facebook. Like I had um, a very, very dear friend who helped me relearn to walk in 2014. And over the course of like, he was like a, a younger brother to me. Like I, he, he meant an incredible amount to me. And over the course of 2016, I watched him get radicalized online. And at the same time, I was working on ranking at, so like the, how we construct the home feed on Pinterest. And so as I interacted with Facebook, while this context was happening in my life, I would see features on the, on the page and I'd be like, how is this not like glaringly obvious what's going on? Um, and, and the reality is the internal culture, like once I got there, I realized why a lot of those things didn't get taken down until after the election like why these features didn't get turned off, which is the internal culture of Facebook has a lot of groupthink. It has a lot of, um, it rewards people who can see the bright side. And because it is so focused on a very limited number of metrics, largely related to growth, you are actively rewarded for not raising the red flag on like, oh, this is happening. And so when I got there, um, I was really shocked at the scope of the problem, like almost from the beginning, that uh, I thought I was gonna work on misinformation in the United States. And I showed up there and I realized, even though like, I think of myself as a reasonably well-read person, I was completely unaware that people were dying in African countries, in Southeast Asia, because of product choices that Facebook made. And that Facebook's answer to that was to have a social cohesion team, because genocide is what happens when social cohesion breaks down that had like 10 people on it, right? Like how do you respond to 200,000 people dying with like a 10 person team? Um, and so the moment where I was like, the system cannot heal itself. Like when I, when I joined, I, I, I saw the face where it was trying to do the right things. It wasn't staffing them enough, but they were at least trying. And right after the 2020 election, they dissolved the part of the company, the center of excellence, that was supposed to be providing a path forward for Facebook. They dissolved civic integrity. And um, 
I, I, I genuinely believe that what happened on January 6th was, was greatly worsened by those choices because it meant there was no one left to th like throw the brake, right? There was no one there to turn the safety mechanisms back on. And so that period of time made me realize I had to figure out a different way forward because Facebook was not gonna be able to solve these problems alone. Like, they needed to bring in people to help solve them together. So let's talk about what the problems are. I think you know one of, so, certainly something I've experienced as someone who is, is concerned about these issues but without the technical acumen and insight that you both have is that I, I feel that my emotion is more anxiety than fear. Fear knows its object. Anxiety is ooh, ooh, unclear what its object true. is. What should be the object of our fear? You've talked a lot, Francis, about sort of what social media is and what it mm -hmm. does. Could you unpack that for us? Sure. So I, it's interesting. We, we, uh, I love that analysis that the difference between fear and anxiety is with fear, you know, you know what you're scared of. Um, I think it's really important for us to all acknowledge that if we were talking about an oil company and we are worried about its consequences on the public, let's say they have an oil derrick in Los Angeles, you know, downstream there's some kids getting sick, the reason we don't turn to that oil company and go, hey, there's this cone of kids getting sick downwind from your oil derrick, we think something's broken. The reason, the reason we don't go to them and say, hey, oil company, what do you think's going on? Is because we have an ecosystem of accountability, mm -hmm. right? We graduate over 50,000 environmental science majors every year. We have public interest think tanks. We have professors who are specialists in this. We have grad students who do fellowships on specific things. We have a whole network of accountability. Facebook knew that that network, that ecosystem of accountability could never grow if they did not release data on how it operated. Because all we see is our individual screens. We have no idea if what's on our screen is representative. We have no idea what the systemic biases are. Um, we have no idea what the consequences are. And Facebook has over and over again refused to even just slightly peek open the curtain. Yeah. So the reason we feel anxious and not afraid is because we have no clue what's going on. And that is the fundamental issue. Until we can get legislative guaranteed access, at least for, at least for academics, ideally civil society groups, we will never be able to build the public muscle of accountability. I want to stay for a moment, though, and going to you, Rashad, on what, what is the problem. What is, what, when, it, when it comes to social media, what is the civil rights harm, so to speak? Again, I think you know, there are the, the cases that we've come that we've come to know, that we've been inculcated with regard to, you know, extrajudicial violence, a cop shooting someone, someone's vote being taken away. We have some keen sense that a clear democratic standard or legal standard is being violated. It's being violated purely on the basis of what you look like and the social significance we attach to that. I think we, we, many of us are aware that if you're black or if you're a woman or if you have a disability, social media is not gonna be as fun of a place for you. There's gonna be different vulnerabilities. But can you help us to specify more clearly what the civil rights question around social media is? Yeah, I mean, there, are, there are a number. And so let me just take a couple of sli slices at a couple of them. Let's take the ads, for instance, right? Which are not free speech, right? And we think about <laughs> ads as, um, and, and in the ads space, right, um, Facebook has, says they don't and we've been back and forth and there's been court cases that they've settled so that they don't actually have to bring them all the way to trial um, that um, you can market housing to basically to white people. You can market jobs just to men. You can create um, data sets that um, provide certain services and opportunities to some people and take it away from other people and, and exclude other people from those opportunities. Things that have been sort of long sort of fought for, engaged around um, sort of uh, um, just, just sort of the sort of marketplace around ads. And they, they talk about sort of they play, try to place ads under this idea of 230 immunity, mm. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which Francis and I testified around um, um, before Congress. And so the, the ads sort of is, is one place. The second place, and this gets to the transparency piece, 
is that because we have no transparency on the algorithms, what mm -hmm. gets amplified, um, what actually um, moves, how recommendations happen, what gets suppressed, we actually have no visibility into all of these human decisions on the back end that kind of go into sort of how the platform ends up operating. And so, of course, the um, the inequities that exist in the broader society, uh, um, a room full of people mm -hmm. creating this platform that may have sort of, as Mark Lucky, the former um, Facebook employee said, there were more Black Lives Matter signs on the Facebook campus than there were black people. And, <gasps> um, and, um, and then I always like to say that the, that the Russians in 2016 seemed to know more about black Americans than the people at Facebook did, um, or at least knew mm -hmm. how to sort of navigate um, sort of racial tensions in a way that the Facebook people either weren't incentivized to catch or didn't catch at all. And so when I think about the, the sort of civil rights implications, it then has like a wide range of experiences because of the sort of um, the deep impact of this platform, right? If Facebook has nearly three billion users, more followers than Christianity, right? If it, if it is the sort of place that can be, uh, um, if, it, if, it, if it can model itself as a public square, but the only thing public about it is that it's a publicly traded company, then we end up in this sort of space where, um, eh, 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 our debates, our, our ability to engage, our ability to be in the marketplace, our ability to engage in democracy is, is, is being sort of geppettoed mm -hmm. by forces that we have no transparency around or no understanding around. And that is really damaging for civil rights because civil rights actually requires a level of transparency inside of societies that we know will have power imbalances. And when power imbalances will naturally exist when people come together mm -hmm. because of um, across gender, across race, across religion, across um, across um, um, you know uh, um, gender identity, sexual orientation, we um, we know power imbalances will exist not being able to track, not being able mm -hmm. to have visibility, not being able to have accountability um, to the places where so many of the decisions about the future are being mm -hmm. made leads us into a place where um, the technology that is supposed to be bringing us into the future is dragging us into the past. Can, can, can I Please, go ahead. Um, one thing that's really important for people to understand is all AI systems, all AI systems are majoritarian unless they are explicitly given context on diversity and rewarded for it. But wait, can you, I wanna ask you more about that because I think there's a, a, in this issue that you're now yeah. both drawing out, which is, and that Rashad, you introduced, which is, you know, you're, there are inequities in society and they're being replicated mm -hmm. in an online environment that shouldn't surprise us. I think one place of debate, Francis, is, is social media introducing new pathologies mm -hmm. or is it amplifying existing pathologies? And Ooh, what's great. your view on that? So I think, I think there's this, uh, so there's, there's different ways of designing social software. Like we should not presume, because we have seen Facebook, that Facebook is the only way for people to have their attention directed. So like let's, let's draw a quick kind of a, a contrast between say a Discord server. So Discord is kind of like Slack or IRC. Um, it's something that's chronological. It's structured much more like how humans structure conversations. So if we had a conference, if we got too chatty in here, we might break up into more rooms, right? Humans are directing your attention. Like, if, 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 if um, we're not relying on an AI to decide what do we focus on. I would say like one of the largest issues with things like Facebook is not all content gets distributed, right? Facebook, like, like Rashad said, has an algorithm that gets to decide what is good and what is bad. And we have seen through Facebook's documents that there are major biases in that content towards extreme content. So uh, things that motivate you to hate, to disgust, to anger, those things get more distribution because you are more likely to click on them, and that engagement means it's better. But to, to finish the, the thought I was saying earlier, every AI is majoritarian. It's not intelligent, right? They, like people who actually work in these systems call it machine learning, not artificial intelligence, because it's just a statistical process. -y. And I'll give you a, like a really concrete example of like how does the algorithm create a different experience? When I worked at Pinterest, um, I helped develop the skin tone filters. You can say, why do you need skin tone filters to like filter content by skin tone? It's because for 
almost every beauty query you did, you would see no black people. And it's not because Pinterest came in and said, we want to be racist or we want to have a bad experience for the 15, 20% of our users that are people of color. It's that uh, the AI said, when we show people a bunch of, of, of pins for eyeshadow, you know, it seems that the white ones get clicked on more. And so they just stopped showing content for people of color, which meant content producers stopped producing content for people of color. And so it's one of these things where we have to design in diversity. We have to have people in the room who ask the questions. Because if we don't ask the questions, it will just make the problems more intense. Yeah. So in, this is reductionist, but in, yeah. in, in the history of civil rights, the way that we've addressed the recognition that the, that the reality of racism as a social phenomenon, the reality of inequity and inequality as a social phenomenon will reproduce itself in our institutions as we set up obligations for public institutions, principally mm -hmm. a version of due process or some derivation thereof. Mm -hmm. And we set up obligations for private institutions, which typically target whatever those vectors are and in and, and ways that are responsive to what a private company does. Private companies distribute opportunity. You can't discriminate in employment. Yeah. Private companies provide services that have some common carriage obligations. Yeah. You can't discriminate in the provision mm -hmm. of those. Are those infrastructures, Rashad, adequate to whatever this thing is that is a social media company? Because in listening to you describe the structure and Francis, you describe the technology, it raises questions about whether this thing is like anything that we've ever dealt with before. Well, nothing is exactly mm. like the thing before. And I think that this is the trick that they want us uh -huh. to believe. They want us to believe that this is so much different uh -huh. than everything before that we have to throw out like, all of the sort of things we know about sort of creating equity while deeply imperfect, right? Like these, the laws that we're asking to apply um, have not created like the type of hierarchy, the, the, kind of the, the type of um, disruption to hierarchy that I would like to fully see, but they, but they, but they advance a type of opportunity that I think um, wouldn't exist otherwise. And so, because of um, the application of rules that were created before these platforms had things like, you know. Algorithms. Algorithms. Before yeah. they had algorithms. <laughs> yes, before they had algorithms. Yeah. Um, we see these platforms arguing and operating that they do not have to, um, that, that, that civil rights law does not apply to them. Yeah. And, um, and I remember when uh, Sheryl Sandberg called me um, to tell me that they were going to settle the lawsuit that the um, Fair Housing Coalition and the ACLU had brought against them for um, housing discrimination. They were going to settle it and not bring it to court. And that she was also calling to let me know that they were going to ban um, white nationalist um, closed groups, which they never actually did, but she mm -hmm. said they were going to do it. And she said, you know, we've come to the conclusion that if we do this, we actually still, we don't have to ban, because I was worried that we were going to have to, because I'd have been arguing with her for like a year and others, Kristen Clark was now um, in the justice, others, we were arguing that she didn't have to ban uh, closed groups for women who were breastfeeding, but she thought that they would have to ban those groups if they banned white nationalist groups. Um, because Inside of Facebook, they have weaponized this idea that conservative bias and bias against conservatives is the same as bias against people because of race, religion, um, gender, um, protected classes, that it's the same thing. To the point that when they launched the racial, the civil rights audit, the same day they announced that they were going to do a conservative bias audit led by John Kyle former senator. The same time they were doing a training on voter suppression on their platform for to help understand voter suppression, led by um, a former um, um, LDF leader, NAACP LDF leader, they brought in someone from the Federalist Society to do a training on um, voter fraud maybe to help people find Big, Bigfoot or whatever else um, <laughs> sort of kind of connects to that. And so all of that to say, like, they have weaponized this idea. So what they've done, and when you end up in conversations with folks who are leaders inside of Facebook at the very top, they um, have this idea of civil rights as not moral, but as political. And so an ad for a pride parade will get flagged as political. 
um, not as social content. Um, and so it gets flagged as a political content because some people get to live in our society on Facebook just as people. And some others of us have to show up every single day and our mere existence is political. And the ways in which we talk about ourselves, our families, and our like ability to live in society gets flagged as political content. And those are rules that are set, right? Those are rules that are determined. These are not just like, thing. and, and then it has like cascading sort of um, results. And without um, accountability, mm -hmm. without laws, without the sort of structures to hold this um, country, this, these, 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 um, this platform that's bigger than any country accountable, what we end up with is growth and profit always mm -hmm. superseding mm -hmm. uh, safety, integrity, and security. So I want, in just a moment, I want to get to this question of solutions as we deal with the, these sort of discontinuities and the ways that these companies present themselves. But Francis, this, I, I think before we do that, we owe it to ourselves to jump beyond our borders for a moment. And I know something you've been thinking a lot about are these questions of equity and equality across borders yeah. and, and, and how differentiated that experience is. Could you talk a little bit about this idea of linguistic equity that you've been sure. able to explain? So, um, you know, when we think about the number 3.1 billion people, like 3.1, like I've never, I've, I've never used the, it's more people than Christianity joke. I'm totally stealing that. Just yeah, you know. Many are more committed um, to Facebook. And, than... and, and the, when we think about a number that big, um, what's crazy is only like eight or 9% of that, those users uh, are in the United States. Right, only eight or nine percent of those users speak English, um, and yet in 2020, Facebook spent 89, 89 percent of their operational budget on misinformation in English, and so they say we have this international fact-checking program with over 80 partners, not telling you which countries those partners are in or how many stories they've been allocated. I recently talked to a woman who was part of the the first uh, fact-checking group in Pakistan. They only have budget to do like 30 or 40 articles a month. Like think of how much content is distributed in Pakistan. Like the idea that you fact check, you know, 30 or 40 pieces and it's like, check the box, we support Pakistan. Facebook has made a platform and made bets on safety strategies, you know, focusing on content. Like the idea that this is good content, this is bad content. They've made, when we focus on content, we have to rewrite those AIs language by language by language. Um, I usually say, like, won't someone please think of the Norwegians? Right? There's like five million Norwegian speakers in the world. They will never get safety systems. But the reality is, like, Norway is stable, right? They have a long democratic institutions. There's, I don't think there's going to be a civil war in Norway anytime soon. But in places in, like, many African countries, many places in Southeast Asia, Facebook has become the internet. And it didn't happen by accident. Facebook went into those countries and said, if you use Facebook, your data is free. If you use anything else, you're going to pay for the data yourself. And as a result, that center of mass in those countries meant that you didn't get your own website if you're a small business. You get a Facebook page. And so it means the largest news source in many African countries is a single five, six million person Facebook group which means they don't have a free press in those countries because the algorithm decides what stories you get to see. You only see a tiny, tiny sliver of the content that was put into that five million person group, but a huge fraction of the people will get it blasted back out to them. And that has profound consequences. We have already seen two major ethnic violence incidents where the UN has said Facebook played a substantial role in fanning this conflict. We have Myanmar, where hundreds of thousands of people died, and we have Ethiopia. And the reason I get up every single day, why I'm on the road like week after week after week, is this is not the end. Yeah. This is not the end. And we can't say people are leaving Facebook in the United States, it's okay, if we leave behind a billion or two billion people for whom it is the internet. So. I wish I were as sanguine as you are about Norway. You should see how they react to immigration. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but let's oh, hope. Let's hope fair. there's one stable advanced democracy yeah. out there. What, um, so, so Francis, you, you have been getting up every day, and you've been talking about some of what we can do yeah. um, in the face of this. So let's start that part of the conversation. What are some of the key areas that you've been focused on, having come from the inside, hmm. to respond to the failures that you saw? So I always like to say, we, we don't have to give up social media. This is not a thing of it's like, oh, it's so toxic, we have to walk away. I know you like it, but you know, eat your spinach. Let's, let's be puritanical on this. That's, that's, that's not the way forward. 
if we were talking about a Facebook from 2008, right, like let's, let's get in our time machines. This audience actually understands when I say this. When I talk to college students, they're like, 2008? Like, I, I, I barely could read in 2008. Um, in 2008, Facebook was about our family and our friends, right? It was about things we actually consented to. Facebook has run experiments where, where when all they do is give you more stuff you consented to, so stuff from your family and friends, from pages you actually followed, from groups you actually joined, versus stuff you didn't consent to. So that's like someone invited you to a group, and Facebook started giving you that content for 30 days. And because you clicked on something, now you follow, you're considered part of that group. Or your friend made a comment on something, and now they put it in your feed. If they just give you more stuff you consented to, for free, you get less hate speech, less violence, less nudity. Because your friends and family are not the problem. The algorithm is the problem. The product choices are the problem. Mm -hmm. And so I think the key is we need transparency. Because like, I can list for you 30 ideas that are in the docs that are about changing up the products designed. But the real question is, if we want to not just optimize on profit and loss and expenses, like, like Rashad said, we have to have the transparency to have that countervailing weight, because we have to be designing collaboratively. Uh, what about you, Rashad? What do you see as some of the key steps? So a couple of things. So you know, I I um, I spent you know about eight months over the past year. Um, co-chairing the Aspen Institute's Commission on Information Disorder and, um, and working sort of with what was a bipartisan group of folks, 15 commissioners, um, three, three of us were co-chairs, Chris Krebs, who was in the, for, in the, in the Trump administration, and Katie Couric, um, um, the journalist. And, um, and, and we, um, you know, we worked for eight months to kind of create some consensus around a set of things that we thought would would help deal with information disorder, which impacts every issue that you, we care about and every issue that is facing this country and facing the world is 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 the is the space around information and and so you know that report is out there, but some of the sort of top lines of that was really I think um, across both government. Uh, private sector and corporation, corporations, private sector and and um, sort of public life, where this was this need for leadership. When I think about sort of the government sort of aspects, I do think that there is going to be a need for reform of Section 230. Um, there is going to be um, um, a need to both deal with product design um, and holding these companies accountable for product design, which is not about speech. If you go on a place like Twitter and you look at Richard Spencer's um, white nationalist um, account, um, you will start being recommended other people to start following just like Richard Spencer. That is a choice, a business mm -hmm. model choice that Twitter is making. That's not a free speech choice. And that's a choice that they've decided sort of helps them you know, maximize their profits. When you think about ads, that once again gets into business and, and sort of business choices. Um, when you, um, we know when we think about sort of um, other aspects of of the things that were not part of the Aspen Reporter, but are very much part of how we think about the work at Color of Change and how we think about it from a civil rights perspective, is that you know we actually need um, robust antitrust regulation and antitrust enforcement. Um, you know we are in a place where we do it at the very least have an FTC that is looking at that and is interested in, in, in antitrust enforcement. And so I think that like antitrust enforcement is one of those places where um, these companies have become um, um, large and unaccountable in ways that um, create real challenges. If Facebook has probably about over 70% of the messenger market when you count um, WhatsApp, um, Instagram and Facebook, you end up seeing sort of all the ways in which we don't have choices and without choices in the marketplace, we're not able to at least um, hold some of these big platforms accountable. You know, we actually need um, infrastructure, government infrastructure to review products before they enter the market, right? The, um, these platforms have a business um, these, these, these platforms sell things, right? And they, and they sell them certain ways. And they should have to, their algorithms and shouldn't just be transparent. We should have review and we should have oversight. Our seatbelts are not safe because of the benevolence of the car industry. Mm. They are safe because there's government infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And they're certainly not safe because members of Congress understand how seatbelts work and they know how to like ask yeah. the right questions to the car industry leaders when they come before Congress. 
Congress. It's because there's a regulatory body with actual infrastructure that can like do the work every mm -hmm. single day and is at scale. Mm -hmm. And that the and that the um, the 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 fines actually matter. And right now the fines are, you know, are like a nice night out for some of us yeah. um, when you kind of put it in the context. <laughs> and so they will get fined and then their stock will go up because everyone's like, okay, now we can go back to what we were doing because like, like this is over. And, um, and so we, we actually need infrastructure, accountability, um, and consequences that are at scale of the problem and at scale of, of the infrastructure that has been allowed to be built um, without much oversight up to this point. I think that those are, those are some of the places. The final thing that I think we need, and I think this is for funders um, in this room, is that, you know, I've had the experience of having to get on the phone with black Democrats in the final hours mm. of markups around antitrust uh, bills and about to lose them, you know, um, because of, you know, the resources. And so as much as we need more facts and more data, because we need that, we need more information, we will always lose in the back rooms if we don't have people lined up at the front door. Yeah. And that requires the, the funding and support for infrastructure that can hold these companies accountable, hold elected leaders accountable, create um, consequences for not for siding with these companies over mm -hmm. people and create rewards for the people who become our champions on this where they feel like there's going to be benefits to them down the road because we've popularized the issue at scale where people recognize that there's going to be um, success in doing something right and that does require a level of support for organizations that are impacted by this across um, communities from, you know, um, groups that work with groups that organize women to groups that organize families to groups that organize API communities and black communities and Latinx communities and immigrant communities. We actually need um, infrastructure at scale and that has to be supported because mm -hmm. um, we can have all the facts and data. And then the, the very final thing that we need is, I'm um, sorry about that. Um, There's a lot to be done. <laughs> is that we need hope. Oh, yeah. in this conversation is because, and you know, I've been for the last year um, um, supporting President Obama and his team at the Obama Foundation as they've um, dealt more with misinformation and disinformation and spoke at a panel that he spoke at a, on a panel at a conference that his team pulled together at Stanford a couple of weeks ago where he gave a very big speech about sort of disinformation and misinformation. And one of the things that I told um, the former president um, when he was asking sort of where he could be most helpful is that um, people need to believe that we can do something about yeah. this problem and that there is a way to solve the problem and that we hear too many people say, I'm just gonna like turn off Facebook yeah. or, we can, or we can like exit Facebook as if that is going, is that, if that's how monopolies work or that's gonna solve <gasps> our problem or that's gonna solve information disorder that you're no longer looking at it. You know, yeah. like I don't watch Fox News but I know it's still there and impacting <laughs> all the work that I'm doing every single day. And so it doesn't matter whether I'm watching it or not, I actually have to have a strategy around its impact. And so, yeah. Well, I wanna, I wanna ask about you both about that because we're getting close to yeah. time and it touches on something Francis said and it touches on, I have to say, something that was a big source of disquiet for me when I was active in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a philanthropy as a funder on this issue, which is, the question of where are we in history? Because I, I hear you say we don't have Great. to, we can't just exit, it's naive yeah. almost. Yeah. I hear you say, Francis, we can have social media. Yeah. But I'm wondering, is it, is it 1890? Can, can, oh, and you've got, some, you've, got some, you've got some people saying, you know, capitalism is a negotiation between labor and capital and yeah. consumers and capital. Mm -hmm. But then you've got this other group of people who say, You're, what brand of dope are you smoking? Yeah. Capitalism is a logic. It's going to seek yeah. surplus value, and surplus value is going to keep dehumanizing you yeah. until there's nothing left. And for a lot of the 20th century, that ladder camp looked crazy. Yeah. From where we sit today, it's not so clear. Yeah. And what is, is, is this sure. something that can be reformed? Yeah. Or is this a logic that will inevitably produce the kinds of harms that you guys have helped draw so, society so to? So I am really depressing every single day. 
Right, so every day I sit in rooms and people ask me all these questions and I'm like genocide, you know, on and on, information disorder. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of a downer. And so I always like to end with the exact same pep talk, which is this, is, this is normal. Like what we're going through right now is really normal. Every single time we have invented a communication technology, it has been incredibly disruptive, right? Like the printing press was actually not disruptive because no one could read. Right, it took like 60 years, Martin Luther came along, he's like, everyone must learn to read, even women must learn to read. And what happened? You had, you had things like misinformation, you had pamphlets on witches, and like how you should burn your neighbor or kill the Jews. And, and a third of Germany died over the next 100 years, right, from the conflicts that were spurned by these things. The, thing, the moment I like to think we're in is in the 1900s, and this is in the 1800s, like 18, I'm not sure when the Spanish-American War was, when, when, when they had yellow journalism and it led to wars. We had a moment where we stepped back and said, okay, we've invented this cheap printing press, newspapers, and people are putting lies in them for their own benefit and causing wars. We have to figure out what to do. What did we do? We invented things like journalism schools. We invented journalistic ethics, journalistic oversight, uh, ownership transparency laws, uh, laws around like you can't have too much concentration in a single media environment. We've done this before. And, and I think one of the things I wanted to call out about what Rashad said is, I love the idea of us having autonomous regulators who look at these problems in an ongoing way. But right now, the place that we are in that arc, the reason we feel overwhelmed is if we can hold an oil company accountable because we graduate 50,000 environmental science majors every year, we are currently teaching zero classes in the United States where you learn the most basic things about how social media works from like a product design perspective. And so we need to think about this as we are building the most basic layer of the accountability system that would even let us staff that regulator. Because I've had things like the State Department come to me and say, we need to train 3,000 people just in the State Department. Right. Imagine how many we're going to have to train for the DSA or the Digital Services Act. And, 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 and to that yeah. point, when and we you, can do it, we've yeah, done it before. And to that point, when you even yeah. when you even engage with with schools that are teaching data yeah. scientists or computer yeah. programming or some of these, you know, other skills that sort of are the sort of the the feeding ground for mm -hmm. engineers and people who are building the tools, those folks are not taking sociology. They can't. They are not yeah. taking history courses, they are not understanding civil rights. And so I end up in these conversations regularly at all of the platforms where I'm like, yeah. I'm, I feel like I'm literally, well we are, my organist, my nonprofit is giving, you know, millions of dollars of consulting money <laughs> to big companies right. to try to help Sorry. them, right? Right, yeah. to try to help them figure out problems because we are, because we, um, have not found a way yeah. to hold them accountable as a society. And that all has to sort of um, be, re be rebalanced. And they'll ask us a lot of questions, they'll take a lot of information, and ultimately we are currently in a place where the, we are begging billionaires to protect our civil rights. Well, I think you guys um, have left us in a, uh, even I'm a little surprised at how hopeful a place you left us, because I think you've, you've articulated not only that you believe this is a soluble problem, yeah. as dramatic and different and new in some ways as it is, but it's a problem that could be solved in the finest tradition of liberal democratic reform yeah. and not revolution. And for funders, we, we're not great at revolution. We have a very august history in supporting liberal reform. So please join me in thanking Francis and Rashad for joining yeah. us today. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah.